Lizard folk are more than just cold-blooded murderers. They have a rich culture with a strong oral history. They have a religion that spans tens of thousands of years. They live hard lives of constant struggle for survival. They are fierce when they need to be and loyal when their word is given. They do not cheat, neither do they lie. More often than not, everything that they do is merely to survive in the harsh environment where they are born, doing their best to make sure that their brothers and sisters see another day. And they're also cold-blooded murderers. The idea of a lizard folk is actually pretty straightforward. Originally, they were called lizard men or lizard people because the general onus of them is that they look like a hybrid of a human and a lizard. Their scales tend to change depending on the tribe and the environment where they reside on. But other than that, they are generally fairly tall, being about six to seven feet tall and weighing about 200 to 150 pounds. Their bodies are strong, their claws are sharp, their scales can take a lot of hits. These guys are ferocious warriors. Now before we get into the weeds here, let's first see what the Monster Manual tells us about these guys, before we start talking about what they don't actually tell you. They are primitive reptilians that lurk in swamps and jungles, with their HUD villages thriving in old forgotten places. They are territorial and xenophobic, when unwelcome visitors are detected Protected, a tribe sends a hunting band to harass or drive the trespassers off, or trick them into blundering into the lair of crocodiles and other dangerous creatures. This part here is crucial to understanding these guys. Lizard folk have no notion of traditional morality, and they find the concepts of good and evil utterly alien. Now, they're truly neutral creatures. They kill when it is expedient and do whatever it takes to survive. They never leave their territories and anyone else that makes it into their lair is killed and eaten. They don't care whether it is a humanoid or a beast or a monster, there is no distinction between them. Rarely they will make alliances, but when they do, they are fierce allies. Lizard folk are omnivorous, but they particularly like humanoid flesh. Prisoners are often taken back to their camps to become the centerpiece of great feasts and rites involving dancing, storytelling, and ritual combat. Victims are either cooked and eaten by the tribe or are sacrificed to Semwania, the lizard folk god. Lizard folk respect and fear magic. Their shamans lead their tribes, overseeing the rites and ceremonies. However, every once in a while, a powerful figure touched by Sassinek, a reptilian demon lord, will be born. This is what we call a lizard king or queen. They are larger, more cunning, and very, very evil. They will take over the tribe and slowly manipulate the tribe into becoming more aggressive and more bloodthirsty. Lastly, lizard folk speak draconic, which they are thought to have learned from dragons in ancient times. A tribe that wanders into the territory of a dragon will offer a tribute to win its favor, though of course, an evil dragon might exploit this fact and instead use the lizard folk to its advantage. Now, I do want to bring to your notice a couple of things. I want you to notice the intelligence stat on the lizard folk. This stat right here is what, generally speaking, a normal lizard folk is going to have. That would be the average of what you would find in this race. The lizard king has a higher intelligence because it has demonic blood. The lizard folk shaman has higher intelligence because of a very rare genetic anomaly that happens sometimes when a lizard folk is born. Now, don't worry, we will talk about that in a bit. The big thing here, though, is that lizard folk are not very intelligent, and their culture shuns intelligence. Females do not breed with intelligent lizard folk, so those genes never propagate. The entire religion of the lizard folk is also literally set on the fact that intelligence sucks. The book doesn't tell you this, but I just wanted it to not be glossed over. Now, lizard folk are special in that we actually have an entire section dedicated for them outside of the Monster Manual for 5th edition in the book Volo's Guide to Monsters. We actually have a section in there just for them. Two delicious pages full of info. Now, the point of these videos is for me to cover what they don't tell you, not what they do tell you. But for the sake of completeness, I do have to at least go over this section as well. 
God, this video is gonna be really long. Now, we'll cover this part at the end of the video, though, so that those of you who actually do own the book don't have to sit through it. In any case, without further ado, let's go over what 5th edition does not tell you about Lizardfolk. The most important thing, and what I want to cover first, is Semwania, which was very shortly mentioned in the Monster Manual as the god of Lizardfolk. This is not the type of god that you might hear about normally, and it is crucial in understanding the culture of Lizardmen. See, Lizardfolk have a very strong oral tradition, since they do not know how to write, and neither would they really be able to sustain books just based on the way they live. People generally have this assumption when they think of lizardfolk that they live in huts in the swamps, but in reality, lizardfolk that have the technology to even make huts are about 1 in 10. Only 1 out of 10 tribes of lizardfolk even know how to make huts. A generic lizardfolk will claw you or bite you to death, and if they have weapons, they would only wield a great club. Lizardfolk that use shields or spears are actually pretty rare and would only come from those tribes that do happen to have above average technology. Most often than not, lizardfolk sleep in leaves. My point is, with this lifestyle, even if they knew how to run, right, they wouldn't be able to really have much of a rich written history, especially considering the fact that they're not particularly good artisans. They don't build temples or churches, instead, the soul of the religion of Semwania is carried in the hearts and words of the lizardfolk. They use stories to convey their teachings and to spread the word of Semwania. Many of these teachings, of course, are told to lizardfolk from the moment that they hatch. The most important story is the legend of where lizardfolk came from. The story goes that a long, long time ago, there were two gods, one called Kekwala and the other called Semwania, and both lived in harmony together. They both prowled the primordial jungles, seeking out their enemies, hunting and scavenging, but also breeding and protecting their eggs. The story says that Semwania settled happily with its life, but Kekwala did not, for Kekwala could not stop thinking. Kekwala would constantly ask pointless questions. It would wonder about whether its decisions were right or wrong. It would concern itself with the consequences of its actions. Because of this, Kekwala made no decisions. It spent its whole life thinking and never accomplishing anything. One day, Semwania asked Kekwala about this and it responded, Quote, how can I watch or hunt or breed without first thinking? The decisions are so many and so great. What if my actions bring trouble? I must be cautious, must be careful, must think things through. End quote. The story says that Semwania did not understand, for Semwania did not think that way. But one day when Semwania returned from hunting, Kikwala was gone. In its place, there were now two Kekwalas. It had seemed that in its indecision, Kekwala had split in half. One of the Kekwalas was aggressive, waving his sharp claws in the air, while the other hid behind its partner, hissing its will to stay home and breed. Quote, Semwanya in its wisdom called the aggressive Kekwala male, and the passive Kekwala female, and helped them build a place to live and breed. End quote. This story is interesting because it relates to the way of life of lizardfolk, and they base their culture on this very old story. See, the lizardfolk believe that those two Kekwalas breeded and from their union came more Kekwalas. Have you ever wondered what lizardfolk called themselves? Do you think that lizardfolk called themselves lizard people? No, that's just ridiculous. That's just a name that humans and demi-humans gave lizardfolk, but it is probably fairly demeaning to them, or at least it would be if they had feelings. No, lizardfolk called themselves Kekwalas. That's what they call their race. The Monster Manual didn't tell you that. Now, the story ends with Semwania essentially taking care of the Kekwalas and helping them make a place for themselves in the world. Why? Because Semwania was the mate of Kekwala, and for lizardfolk, there are only two things that matter. Feeding and breeding. Semwania can feed, but it cannot breed without Kekwala. Problem is, for as long as Kekwala continues to be split, it is not whole, and without the whole, Semwania cannot breed with it. But this is why Semwania, as a god, helps the lizardfolk, and this is why the lizardfolk pray to Semwania, who gives them some semblance of protection and help. 
Now, if you paid attention to the story, you would realize that the moral of it is that thinking is bad. Kikwala essentially screwed himself over by thinking too hard. And this is a lesson that all lizard folk teach their children and each other. Bringing it back to what I said in the beginning of the video, lizard folk hate intelligence. If you're intelligent, you'll be somewhat ostracized by the community and nobody will want to mate with you. Now, just like there is a difference between intelligence and wisdom, there is a difference between being smart and being cunning. See, lizard folk respect cunning. They hate intelligence. This is one of the many reasons why their technology level is so low, why they refuse or seem unable to progress, and why their greatest achievement seemingly is building huts made out of reed. Quote, Lizardful condemned intelligence as pointless and wasteful. They believe that life is meant to be lived and that hunting, fighting, and breeding matters most. Intelligence leads to overthinking situations and to the corruption of their straightforward culture. End quote. The story also showcases the very clear roles that sex has in the society of lizardfolk. Males hunt and scout, while females breed and protect the home. Lizardfolk culture is a traditional patriarchal society where the most physically powerful becomes the leader. Whenever there is a dispute of any kind, typically it is resolved via a duel to the death, including disputes of who is the leader of the tribe. Keep in mind that the shamans, even though they are highly ranked within the hierarchy, of the society are never actually leaders, merely they advise those who lead. Now, even more interesting, if you paid attention to the story, you might have noticed that the gods Semwanya and Kekwala didn't actually have a sex. It was only after Kekwala split in half that its two sides each had a sex, and then each side had a defined role. See, and this is cool, when a lizardfolk is born, there is a very low chance that the baby will have the sexual organs of both males and females. When this happens, the baby will also be born with much higher intelligence than the others. These lizard folk are considered to be holy, for they are, essentially, the two pieces of Kikwala combined, the two sexes combined into one, who also happen to be highly intelligent, just like Kikwala was. These lizard folk are the only ones who are essentially allowed to be intelligent within the community. They are highly respected and given roles of advisors to the leaders, and of course, they become the shamans. This is why the shaman in the monster manual has a higher intelligence score than the traditional lizardfolk. The caveat, however, is that by the nature of their double sex organs, these special lizardfolk are actually infertile, so they cannot reproduce. Now, it is described to us that it is actually very, very difficult to tell a male lizardfolk from a female lizardfolk, that the only observable way, other than very intimate examination, is through the crests. A male has a single long crest that runs from the top of its head all the way down to the shoulder blades. Females, on the other hand, have two smaller crests that run parallel to the back of their necks. That's basically the only way to tell them apart. The rule of thumb is, if if you find a female in a swamp, you're actually very dangerously close to their camp. And if you find a male, you're probably looking at a scout far from camp. Now, lizard folk reproduce sexually, as in they literally have sex. The female will then lay about one to three eggs several weeks after the mating process. The eggs which will be buried down under the ground. Now, this part is really cool. The eggs of lizard folk are very sensitive to what actually happens during this period, which is uncommon when compared to other eggs. Normally, a chicken, for example, will generally be the same regardless of where you nurture the egg. And of course, the baby chick uses the yolk of the egg and the white to feed itself during the process. This is not the case for the lizard folk baby inside of the lizard folk egg. There really isn't a yolk to the lizard folk egg and the baby does not feed using anything inside. Instead, the lizardfolk egg has pores in it, and it actually absorbs things outside of the egg to use for sustenance. Because of this, first of all, these eggs are inedible and are extremely bitter. You cannot eat them. Predators do not really eat these eggs. 
Anyways, it is really interesting that lizardfolk babies don't actually develop genitalia until only about a week before it hatches, because it actually waits and sees how well taken care of the egg is to decide its gender. See, when the egg is buried, it is typically buried with composed plant matter and water. This will serve as nutrients for the egg to absorb. If the egg was buried with not a lot of nutritious plant matter, then the egg will produce a male lizardfolk. Evolutionarily speaking, this is because if there isn't a lot of nutrition or a lot of care given to the egg, then it is assumed that the lizard folk are struggling and don't have a lot of food to give, which means that they need more male warriors, probably, in order to obtain more food. A female lizard folk would produce too much of a strain on the society because females don't hunt for food, and instead breed which would create even more mouths to feed. So essentially, the lizard folk have evolved for the eggs to know if the tribe is suffering and require more warriors. Now, on the other hand, if the egg was nurtured with a lot of plant matter and a lot of nutrients, then there will be a 50% chance that it'll be born a male or a 50% chance that it would be born a female. It doesn't end there, though. It gets even crazier. The coloration of the scales of a lizard folk are actually dependent on the ground, dirt, mud, water, and nutrients that the egg absorbed during its time underground. See, the egg tries to modify its genes in a way so that the lizard folk will grow scales that are similar in color to the foliage around where it was born. That way, the lizard folk would have an easier time camouflaging in its home. This means that, technically speaking, you could actively create lizard folk that can have any kind of interesting scale colors. All of it depending on the color of the plant matter that you buried the egg with. Now, the problem here, though, is that lizard folk are very tribal based. You would never see a lizard folk purposefully have its baby have red scales or white scales just for the fun of it. They instead want their whole tribe to be of a single color to create a more cohesive group and for everybody to feel like they belong together. Plus, the Herald of Semwanya, the celestial entity that Semwanya would send to the material plane to bring its word to the lizard folk, is an albino lizard man called Spirit Scale. So, purposefully creating a white scaled lizard folk would probably be considered heresy within the community. But yeah, since we are on the subject, if you were to see an adventurer lizard folk or just a particularly powerful shaman or druid, if the lizard folk were to do any form of high level cleric or druid spell in order to converse with its god, it would be Spirit Scale who would answer. He is the Herald of Semwania. Semwania does not answer and never, and I mean ever, talks to anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. The only times that Simwania has ever done anything actively for the lizard folk were in times when hundreds of thousands of lizard folk were in danger of dying because of massive wars or cataclysmic events. But literally nothing short of that will ever get Simwania to intercept for the lizard folk. Remember, Simwania is not only the god of breeding and hunting, but it is also the goddess of survival and well, self-reliance in your survival is crucial. At least that's what Simwania thinks. That's what it teaches. Also, Simwania is a she when she has been prayed for for breeding purposes, and he is a he when he is preyed upon for hunting and warring purposes. Its sex changes depending on which side of Simwania you're praying to. But yeah, anyways, if a high-level cleric or druid lizard folk were to cast a spell like planner ally, he would get a celestial or fiendish dinosaur, giant crocodile, hydra, or what is known as the tendriculus. These are the sort of monsters that Spirit Scale would send in order to help a cleric of Simwania. A spiritual weapon spell made by such a lizard folk would grow in the shape of a great club, the favorite weapon of Simwania. Now, in times of war, lizard folk pray to Semwania via short hisses and reptilian barks made before battle. In times of peace, you would see long chants and epic songs intoned in Draconic. Quote, Semwania's only temples are in the hearts and minds of his worshippers. Only the occasional symbol or idol is made as a physical representation of its worship. End quote. Before we move on though, I do want to point out that even though these scales can change color depending on the region where the egg was buried, body size, eye color, and the number of serrations on their crests are all inherited traits from their parents. 
Also, lizard men do have skin beneath their scales. Their skin is actually a thin white membrane. It is this membrane that grows the scales. Now, lizard folk are omnivores. They will eat anything as long as it is literally edible. The monster manual does say that they prefer humanoid flesh, though what it doesn't say is which kind. Though you probably already guessed it. Lizard men favor human flesh above all other kinds. It is considered to be their favorite type of meal. In fact, this is how the demonic lizard kings foment aggressiveness within the lizardful community. See, the monster manual mentions a specific lizard demon that once in a while corrupts a lizard folk and turns it into a more powerful, more intelligent version. And that lizard folk typically becomes king or queen thanks to his or her newfound strength. This king or queen will generally turn the tribe evil by making them more aggressive. What the monster manual doesn't tell you is how they do it. Generally speaking, what happens is this king or queen will instill into the tribe a stronger desire for human flesh. In fact, if it has to, it'll go so far as to make it a weekly ritual to capture humans in order to feast on them. A ritual that, if missed, will result in deadly consequences. For itself, the king or queen will ask for at least two humans to be brought to him or her to be eaten every single week. If no humans can be found, then two demi-humans of any kind. Demi-humans are dwarves, elves, gnomes, etc. And if any of those cannot be found either, then the king or queen will kill and eat two of its bodyguards. This is how they make the tribe slowly more aggressive and slowly more evil. Now, this is the case specifically only for the demonic kings and queens that can sometimes be born. They do these things out of sheer malice and to corrupt the tribe. But normal natural lizard people already do have some of these desires. For example, lizard folk don't actually have any pets because they typically will just eat them. Lizard folk don't really have emotions. They only have approximations of emotions and only to three types of emotions. They can feel fear, they can feel pleasure, and they can feel aggressiveness. Or rather, once again, they only really feel approximations of those things, but only those things. We will talk a little bit about that later, because that's part of the entry in Volo's Guide to Monsters. But my point here is that they have no quarrels about eating humans, and to them, it is no better or worse than eating a monster or a beast or a pet that has been with them for years. And it is no better or worse than eating their lizard folk neighbor. In fact, whenever a member of the tribe passes away, they're actually eaten by the others in a form of ceremonial wake. In this way, they become part of the tribe again, not just figuratively, but literally. Due to the martial nature of the lizard folk, their lack of emotions and their cannibalistic attitudes, humanoids see them as a violent and savage race, but the reality is that their costumes and their methods actually change from tribe to tribe. Quote, they generally have no strong leaning towards any extreme alignment and no particular philosophy other than survival of the fittest. They will defend their territory ferociously, but when approached respectfully, most tribes trade and negotiate with other races willingly." End quote. It is also important to mention that lizard folk despise deception and the concept of politics. Quote, if they want something that another race possesses, they might try to trade for it or take it by force. Each tribe differs, but most broadcast their intentions straightforwardly and openly. End quote. A tribe of lizard folk typically numbers around 150 members, including females and hatchlings. When at war, if they feel like they have more numbers than their enemies, then their tactic is to simply charge. The small horde of lizard folk, for the most part, will behave independently and without much coordination. It will basically look like a straightforward, massive charge of dozens of lizard folk. They will generally try and push the enemies towards the water where they know that they have the advantage. Things, however, get interesting when they feel like they are on the defensive, when they have less numbers. This is when their cunning really starts to shine. You will never see them use traps or ambushes or anything nefarious like that when they simply overpower you, but if you're stronger than they are, you will see all kinds of shenanigans being used. The full extent of their cleverness in building pitfalls, wire traps, using poisonous plants, etc. If you happen to be dealing with the 1 in 10 tribe, the tribe 
tribe that at least knows how to use shields or spears and build huts, then you might see more advanced forms of warfare, like having your supply lines burned down. In combat, however, merely because their brain literally only focuses on two things, breeding and feeding, you might actually see most lizard folk become actually distracted every single time that they take down an opponent. That's because every time a person dies in front of them, they get this rush and craving to feed and eat. Similarly, they might get the same level of distraction from shinies and gems, tools that can be used to signify treasures of war that will allow them to impress a female back in camp. Lastly, I do want to point out, because I know this probably goes against popular perception, but a third of all lizard folk that exist actually live underwater. Lizard folk can't actually breathe underwater, so what they do is they find underwater caves with pockets of air where they can layer. They are great swimmers and can hold their breath for far longer times than humans and demi-humans can. Also, I am a little bit torn on something because it, it seems rather too peculiar. As far as I am aware, we haven't really gotten a very detailed description of how the jaw or mouth of a lizard man is supposed to look like outside of the official art that we have gotten. I mention this because I came across a really interesting paragraph in an old Dungeons and Dragons magazine that talks about the teeth of lizard men. Here, I'm gonna quote it for you. Quote, the jaws of lizard folk bear a unique construction of solid stone plates with a serrated front edge. End quote. Now, at first I figured that they were talking about something like this, sort of like bony spikes that jut out of the jaw from the sides. But then it says this, quote, The sharp edge of the jawbone protrudes from the gum line, functioning as canines for ripping meat, while molar-like ridges run along the rear of the jawbone. End quote. I'm actually not sure if I am misinterpreting this, but they make it sound as if lizard folk don't actually have teeth, but rather it's all spiky serrated bones that poke out of their gums directly from their jaw. I'm not sure if this means that their teeth are all bone, or if they have both animal-based teeth and bone teeth, or if they mean something like this. This is the official picture for lizard men in second edition. Notice how the actual lips have a, a serrated look to it. I'm not sure if that's what they mean because the idea of him having not normal teeth but instead spiky bones that come out of their gums, it just sounds too crazy. But hey, maybe that's what it is. Normal teeth are actually stronger than bones, so this would make the bite of a lizard folk weaker, I think. I don't know. Let me know what you think about this. I'm actually curious. Boy, this video is already far too long for me to really cover in detail Volo's guide to monsters. Once again, these videos are supposed to be me finding out really cool stuff that 5th edition does not tell you. Not what they actually do tell you. Because I guess the idea would be that all of this information, I mean, you could already access it on your own. But to give a small summary of what you can find here. Essentially, lizard folk are emotionless. I mentioned part of this before when I said that they really only have three types of emotions. Fear, aggressiveness, and pleasure. But even still, they, they feel these things as detached concepts. They don't actually fully feel them in the same way that a human does. This translates as well to a complete detachment of the past and little care for the future. They're not worried about what the future might bring, neither do they feel nostalgic about the past. They fully live in the present and they only care about what they need right now to survive. To a lizard folk, a comrade who dies becomes a potential source of food. Art and beauty have little use to them. They don't rage when a family member is killed. They don't quake in their boots when a terrible monster appear. They don't laugh when a good joke is told. They have no emotions. Everything in here is basically all about this lack of emotion and there's plenty of examples as to how that affects their day to day and what impact that has on their behavior. If you want to explore this particular side of their mind, then I actually do suggest to go and read it. It's, it's a pretty good read. I just don't have time on this video to cover it.
I would like to personally thank my Patreon supporters, Rukato Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry Maskant, 5E Magic Shop, Anthony Clias, Toby Oliver, Jog Jaguth, Lord of Dreams, Daniel Umar, Zach Bowell, Max D, Noah Perkins, Simon Holman, and Midi Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Guys, thank you so much for staying here all the way until the end. I, I think this might be the longest video that I have done on D&D, at least uh, as far as the new D&D videos are concerned. This was... Uh, man, I, I don't know if I want to make another video this long. This was crazy, but there was just a lot of stuff to talk about. There really was a lot to talk about here. In any case, uh, please go and make sure that you watch the playlist for all of my D&D videos. They are all awesome. If you like this one, I guarantee you that you're going to like all of the other ones. So please make sure to go and click that playlist and watch them. Uh, otherwise, go follow me on Twitter. Go leave me a comment down here in the comment section so that I can know. If you guys enjoyed the video, let me know what was your favorite thing that you learned about uh, the lizard folk. And let me know what other types of creatures you guys want to know about. Leave those comments down below. Thank you once again for watching and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.